afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Ben Williams with Ford Community Investments and we're excited to have you join us for today's presentation. Before we get going though, I'd like to just take this opportunity to share a little bit of background about how we got here today. Ford Community Investments has worked with Wisconsin nonprofits for over 20 years and we build the capacity of these nonprofits through low-cost loans and expert advisory services. As one of the most established financial management advisors of its kind in Wisconsin, FCI provides clients with guidance, resources, skills, and capacity building as a means to build a strong, secure, and sustainable community, one nonprofit at a time. Wisconsin nonprofits today are, are faced with many complex problems. Based on the survey we did last year of the economic impact on nonprofits, over 58% reported expenses increasing, while only 37 reported increases in their revenues to go with it. It's this fragile financial cycle that has been challenging for many nonprofits and demands more strategic leadership and efficient uses of finance more than ever before. The good news is that with the support of BMO Harris, Ford Community Investments is offering a series of webinars over the course of the year and, and to further build the effectiveness. Just to say a few words about BMO Harris, they, 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 two years ago, Harris and M&I came together to form BMO Harris Bank North America, a strong U.S. bank that offers more for their customers and communities it serves. They're an active partner in our community and are committed to being a, a committed corporate citizen as an important part to how they approach business. We applaud their, their efforts in supporting the nonprofit community and are excited to have them as a partner for our series. Before I turn it over to Preeta, I would just like to walk through a few housekeeping points. If you look uh, on the screen, you will see that you can dial in either using the telephone number and access code or using your computer speakers. You can change this in the audio function uh, uh, on the panel for GoToMeeting. We'll be taking questions during this webinar, so if you have any questions, please submit it through the chat function which can be found on the window on the right side of the screen, and, and we'll answer those at several interviews, as, inter intervals, as well as having uh, an opportunity at the end of the session for some general questions. We'll also be using polls to understand and, and get your feedback as we go through it, and so we'll test one of those out right now by starting a poll on what your role is in your organization. And so if you can please respond to the poll that you see on screen, and thank you all that have, that have begun entering. I see we have about half or so of the members are executive directors. About 30% look to be staff members. 15% are board members. Thank you all for, for participating in this. And then if you want to test by entering in the questions feature, you can write your name and organization just to show how, how that feature works as well. Thank you to those who voted. And again, the questions can be submitted in the box there, and you can type in, and, and, we'll, and we'll have those questions saved and ready to answer either at the interval or at the very end of the session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, and the topic of leadership development is Preeta Nayak of the Bridgespan Group. Preeta is a manager in the Bridgespan's San Francisco office. And while there, she's worked with a variety of nonprofit, foundation, and public sector clients on questions of strategic planning and organizational design. She's a member of Bridgespan's leadership and organization practice and leads the firm's leadership team development program, Leading for Impact. She's also a co-author of the recently released book, Plan A, How Successful Nonprofits Develop Their Future Leaders. At this time, I'd like to turn over the call to Preeta. Thanks, Ben, uh, and hello, everybody. Um, hopefully at this point what you're seeing is uh, the presentation in front of you. Um, as Ben mentioned, um, I'm a manager in Bridgespan San Francisco office and lead um, much of our work in leadership development. I'm really delighted to be here today and to share some of our re recent research and work on leadership development. In particular, as Ben said, we've just published um, some of what we've learned in a book called Plan A, How Successful Nonprofits Develop Future Leaders. And uh, I believe Ben will be sending out links to that as well as um, to some other resources at the close of this session as well. Yes, I will. 
So some of you may be familiar with the Bridge Band Group from our strategy consulting or perhaps from some of the publishing that we um, We also focus on leadership development and um, a big part of that is to actually share best practices that we're learning from our research and our work on critical topics. And there's frankly no topic that we found that's more important and challenging than the question of how to develop leaders in the future. For today's discussion, we really have three goals. First, just want to share some of the research that we've done on this topic with you. Second, discuss the organizational habits that you can build to address the challenges that you're facing. Um, and last, but certainly not least, share some of the tools and approaches that you can go ahead and begin to use to build those habits that um, you want to develop in your teams and your staff. Throughout the call, we're going to want to get your input in questions. And so as Ben said, we'll be asking a few polling questions. We'll stop at a couple of points during the presentation, as well as at the end, um, to hear from you. So, why don't we start our discussion with a little bit of background on the nature of the Leadership Development Challenge. In 2006, BridgeSpan's co-founder, Tom Tierney, wrote um, a report called The Leadership Deficit. And what we found was that through a combination of factors, retirements, growth of nonprofit organizations, movement in and out of the sector, um, that there was a an impending challenge facing facing um, facing us. In particular, that by 2016, their estimate was that the sector was likely to need 80,000 more senior leaders each year. So that's 80,000 new highly qualified leaders um, for the sector. Now the problem is that as a sector, we're actually not that strong in leadership development. In the course of BridgeSpan's work with clients, we've asked over 500 nonprofit senior teams to assess where they feel they're strong and where they feel they're weak as an organization. And based on these assessments, we know that leadership development and succession planning is actually considered the greatest organizational weakness by nonprofit leaders. We see that consistently in the survey results. And so to dig deeper and find out what was happening here, we developed a leadership development survey, a diagnostic survey, which now over, I think, a thousand leaders have taken, and that Ben will share with you later a link to. And um, But for now, what I'd like to do is ask you all, and we'll use the quick poll format to do this, the closing question from the survey. And so the question is, to what extent do you agree with the following statement. My organization is highly effective in developing, in developing a strong pipeline of future leaders. Ben, are you able to pull that poll up? Yep, and the poll is going. So far, we've had approximately half of the members vote, and, and, I'll, sh and I'll share those results as they come in. It looks like about 20% or so strongly disagree, about half somewhat disagree, and about 30% somewhat agree. No one has responded that they strongly agree. Thanks so much. And um, yeah, th those results are spot on for what we've seen from the broader survey. Only about a third of the leaders we've surveyed um, using our diagnostic tool agree or strongly agree, and only about 6% strongly agree that their organizations are highly effective in developing a strong pipeline of future leaders. So, um, you know, depending on, on where you fell in that response, while your individual organization may be doing somewhat better, we know that as a sector overall, we have some challenges here. And in fact, when we started this research on the topic, what we did was actually talk with a lot of organizations to understand um, what they were feeling good about and where they were challenged. And executive directors often told us that they felt like they knew that they were doing some things well, but they just didn't have a complete picture of what to do and really how to make these activities part of everyday operations. Um, nor did they have a sense of what some of the best practices were that others were using either in the for-profit or nonprofit sector. 
So the research that we did for the guide and that I'm going to be sharing with you today actually looks at both of these things. What's the overall picture of best practices and then what are some specific examples that you might put into place? So let's start with the overall picture. Um, what we found is that for-profit and nonprofits that are most effective at leadership development have put in place five core processes. And then for each of these processes, they use certain practices and tools which become ingrained in what they do every day. So they, in fact, become organizational habits and part of the culture. So the first process is, perhaps not surprisingly, engaging senior leaders. In every successful example we found of an organization that does a good job of building their pipeline of leadership talent, the executive director or the CEO was leading the process. They were, in many ways, acting as the chief talent officer. Now, that doesn't mean that they weren't getting significant support from others, including a COO or an HR director. But what was essential was that the senior, the most senior most leader, your CEO, was placing this as a priority, and then making it a priority for each of their direct reports as well. The second process that we'll talk about a little bit more today is all about understanding future needs. So what we found is that effective organizations think about their leadership needs three to five years out because it can often take that long to develop future capabilities. So they stop to think about strategy and direction in the future and then assess the potential of current staff to fill those needs. We will spend a little bit more time on this today um, because I, we believe strongly that if you don't take the time to think about what you might need ahead, you'll be far less likely to develop the talent that you need. The third process is developing future leaders. So by translating future needs into individual development plans and developing the talent using a model known as 70-20-10. And we'll talk a little bit more about what 70-20-10 entails a little bit later. The fourth process is about hiring leaders externally. So um, no matter what your size or type of organization, you're not likely to find all of the new leaders you'll need internally. And so one of the things we'll do is talk about how to uh, you know, choose those places where it may be most effective to bring someone in from the outside and how to do that well. And then the fifth process is monitoring and improving practices. And this is, just goes along with what you would say about any aspect of your organization or program, that an effective organization is going to look at their results and what they're doing to get there so that they can get better over time. Last but certainly not least, all of this um, becomes essentially part of your culture, of the culture that is created when current leaders make these processes habits. So today we're going to concentrate in this discussion primarily on processes two and three, understanding future needs and developing future leaders. Um, as I've mentioned, the guide itself is organized according to these steps, and so you can learn more and dig in more deeply in each of these areas um, if you'd like to as well. So at the heart of developing future leaders well is determining what capabilities and roles you'll need to achieve your strategy and future ambitions. And this is an important step many organizations don't take the time to do. The result is succession planning often becomes an exercise in replacement planning. So you operate under the assumption that tomorrow's successful leader is going to be exactly like the leader of today. And that's simply not the case in many instances. So that if, you, if you make that assumption, the development efforts you undertake may not actually link to your strategy and may not prepare people adequately for the future. So what I'd like to do is actually share one example of an organization that was making a significant change and what that meant for their um, leadership pipeline. During our research, we had the opportunity to interview Bob Ottenhoff, the former CEO of GuideStar, and his COO, Deborah Snyder. So GuideStar, as many of you know, is a nonprofit that gathers and publicizes information about nonprofits. And in 2000, they made a significant shift in their business model. At the time, one of their core funders, the Omidyar Network, in effect told them, look, 
we're very supportive of what you're doing, but we need to see you become independent of philanthropy for your core operations. This is probably something many of you have heard before, but GuideStar was totally dependent at the time for its operations on philanthropy, and so this was a major change. And in Bob's words, it really was a defining moment for the organization, one that caused GuideStar to rethink their business model and in turn to rethink their leadership needs. Specifically, they realized that the best way to sustain and grow over time was to generate more revenues through fees, that they couldn't give away all their products and services as they had until then, and they determined that to upgrade the quality of their services as well as the client support they provided. In terms of talent and leadership, they concluded that they needed to build that they needed to build stronger marketing and sales capabilities, and they also needed to develop products that were more user-friendly. Both of these meant a shift in capabilities at both the senior level and among the staff, including bringing some new talent on board. So what I'd like to do now is turn to your organizations and your future leadership needs. So Ben, I'd love to do another quick poll and um, ask the following question, which is, Compared to today, the leadership capacity in your organization that you'll need to succeed in the future is likely to be either significantly different, somewhat different, or largely the same. Great, and so the responses are coming in. We've got about half the vote so far. I'll wait just a little bit. It looks like Around one-third are saying significantly different. About 60% are reporting somewhat different. And about 5 to 8% are reporting largely the same. Great. And again, this mirrors what we've heard from not only the diagnostic surveys we've done, but the conversations we've had with leaders. And what we see is that organizations are often seeing what may only be a 20 or 30 percent change in the types of needs they do. Much of what they're going to be doing in the future is similar to what they're doing today. But that 10 to 30 percent change may be very critical to their future strategy and ambitions. And so accomplishing that change is really going to require stepping back, thinking about the leadership and overall talent implications, and then thinking through how to best prepare recognizing that no, um, you know, no predictions are going to be 100% accurate. So what I'd like to do now is just share a framework or a set of questions that can help you think about future needs a little bit more systematically. So what you can do is just start with your future direction and list out some of the expected strategic changes you imagine might happen over the next three to five years. So it may be that you um, are thinking about new programs or initiatives. You might have more sites growing, changes in who you're serving, changes in how you're funded. But for the purposes of, of, of today's conversation, and even as you're thinking along with us, maybe think about one initiative or change that you think is going to be important. Then think about what you as an organization will actually have to do in order for that initiative or change to succeed. Then consider what positions within the organization will this affect. So in some cases, it may be new positions. But in many cases, it may be that your existing staff and roles will have to change somewhat. So for example, GuideStar did this and found that it needed to strengthen, in some cases, build its marketing and sales capabilities. But it also had staff that were very focused on building content. That it, would, that it was certainly going to retain, but that content might have to look a little bit more different in a situation where you were selling that content. So the next steps are then to translate these future needs into leadership requirements. And one way to make this specific is to think about the behaviors you'd expect in the future from individuals uh, in the positions you've identified and what is it they have to do well, and once you've done this, you can also think about the different capabilities and experiences that these individuals need. Now, if you're like most of us, um, 
you know, thinking ahead in this way, and in particular imagining things that you've never done before can be, can be challenging, and it can be hard to know, well, how do I even know what the answer to these questions are? So I think the, the, what we've seen that works well is there's some element of just having this discussion as a senior team, maybe with your board or others, to, to start to generate ideas. The other is actually to look to other organizations that may already be doing some of these things and tr talk with them to understand what capabilities they've built. Um, while you might not get the exact answer, we firmly believe that you'll be further along and much closer to where you need to be in order to start doing the training and development that you need. So I do want to stop here because I know we've talked about quite a bit already and see, Ben, if there were any questions that were coming up on the material we've talked about so far. Yes, so if anyone has a question, please feel free to post it in, in the questions box and, and we'll be able to address them now. One question that I see, Preeta, if you, if you could address it, you know, maybe just generally as, as a concept, is for those that are uncertain what types of changes are they going to need, how can they work to develop that leadership skills if, it, if it's just a matter of dealing with uncertainty? Yeah, I think that um, I think it's a fair question. My suggestion would be that um, um, while there will always be uncertainty, um, it would be worthwhile even just looking at your near-term strategy or even perhaps thinking about trends that you've already seen, so shifts that you've already seen underway that might continue, to try to identify those. Because while, um, while it's true that you're not going to be able to predict 100% what's needed, um, you absolutely can narrow the band and start having the conversations. And even by just doing that, you'll become much more attuned to signals internally or externally. If you are, I mean, in an ideal world, you're developing a strategy every few years that is helping you to sort of decide what the future will need, and that can be the basis of the conversation. What, one other question we have is, should the organization's leadership assessment be competency-based? Um, so in terms of uh, performance reviews and performance management, um, if that's if that's where the question is, is headed. Uh, I think we do find that the most kind of sophisticated organizations or those who um, are most successful have identified the competencies that they need in their leaders. Um, if nothing else, I think that helps you to very clearly identify not just who's performing well today, and, but also who has potential to do so in the future. And, as we'll see in a moment, um, even coming to agreement by, by establishing competencies, um, you, you can start to come to agreement as a team on what you're going to need. Great. And then one other question. Realistically, what leadership skills can be developed internally beyond the technical ones? Um, so I am actually a pretty big believer on the ability, depending on the time you have available, to develop the um, you know, vast majority of leadership skills internally. And the reason I say that, and we're going to talk about this later, is how important experience is in leadership development, such that um, you know, the, doing the work itself can be um, the way that you build it. Now, now here's where it gets difficult. If you're on a relatively short timeline, um, or you need someone who's doing something that, you know, where there's no opportunity to practice or build in-house over time, I think that's where going externally can be um, more important. Hmm. So, but it would be, um, you know, I think it's a it's an interesting. I mean, the two questions we just got are interesting paired together because my guess is once you start thinking about what some of the competencies are, you can also step back to ask yourself which of these do we think we could build internally, and which of these are going to be very hard to do, and we just essentially need to quote buy that skill from another organization. That's a great point. Okay, so. Um, 
let me just push us ahead a little bit to, to talk about a couple of things. Now, before moving on from this future needs assessment point, I, I will say that um, you know, uh, there, are a couple, there may be a couple of natural times to have this conversation in your organization. The first time would be any time you update your strategy. So, um, you know, and that, that may be every few years. When you're in the process of your strategic planning, your strategic plan should have a section that is actually dedicated to understanding, in order for this strategy to play out effectively, what will our talent and leadership needs need to look like in the future. Um, some people make this a question they then revisit during their annual planning, um, so you can kind of see how you're progressing. Um, and you know, if you're a smaller organization that has not, you know, not as many of these formal processes in place, it may be as simple as, as the executive director with your, you know, couple of senior team members or with your board actually making an effort, you know, once a year to step back and say, you know, here's here's where our leadership team is developing right now. Here's what we might need in the future. So have the conversation. I think just having that conversation will change and improve the mindset that you need. So assuming you've done this future thinking, the next step is to assess how your current or potential leaders stack up against these future needs. And to do this means you have to talk, think about the future potential of your talent. So in our survey, uh, our diagnostic survey, about half the respondents said that they consider staff potential as part of their evaluation process. But we find that few actually have tools or approaches that help them do this systematically. So let me introduce you to a tool we call the performance potential matrix. And you might consider using this. In fact, as we review this tool, I would love for folks to just think about one of your direct reports and where you might place them within the matrix. So what I'm showing here is the performance axis of the matrix. So most organizations assess individuals on performance and are reasonably experienced at determining who their strong performers are, who their good performers are, and who their poor performers are. But the point of this tool is to also look at potential, shown here on the y-axis. By looking at both dimensions, you can determine who among your staff both perform well today and who has the potential to play a broader leadership role in the future. For example, in the blue boxes here, you may have um, those folks who um, are performing well um, but have a limited potential, so strong players, reliable professionals. So they, they are people you might want to retain, but they may not be taking on additional roles in the near term. Hopefully you'll have a few individuals who are in these green boxes. These are folks who may be most prepared or most on the uh, cusp of taking on broader roles. You are likely, at least in the course of your organization's history, to have a few individuals in the red box, so chronic underperformers, um, where you are going to have to address the issues there. And then you're also likely to have some folks in the yellow boxes. In our experience, thinking about these individuals is more complicated. They seem to have high potential, but performance is not what you'd like it to be. And it may be that they're at an early stage of development, or perhaps there's some sort of misalignment between the skills and the competencies they have and the role that they're in. So you're, you're thinking about applying this kind of grid and assessing your direct reports. One challenge you may find, most find, is thinking about how to actually define something like potential. And you want to have criteria and standards to assess that the same way you have criteria and standards to evaluate performance. The corporate executive board, um, who we talked to during our research, collects best practices from the for-profit companies. And they shared this uh, basic schematic with us. 
And they said, you know, when they looked across those who do some sort of potential evaluation, they really suggest that you consider three criteria. One is ability. So these may be the future-oriented capabilities that your leaders will need, how effective they are in learning new information, their in emotional intelligence, or, or maybe some technical and functional skills. Next is engagement. So really identifying those individuals who are committed to the future of the organization, who are really um, interested in putting in that extra discretionary effort and want to remain with the organization over the longer term. And then last but certainly not least, aspiration. You know, who aspires to do more? We all know that different people have different motivations, and these can be influenced by factors like stage of life or their personal situation. And so they, they may change over time. None of these are necessarily static. But you can see that using this kind of tool enables you to see the overall picture for somebody's potential. And then the performance potential matrix that we just talked through is a tool that lets you um, map out and look through your staff overall. You can plot your current and future leaders on one page, see if you have leaders who are ready to take on more now, and also determine if you, if you are likely to have leaders in place at the right time to meet your future needs. One thing I'd like to do is just uh, emphasize that the reason to do this, in addition to sort of just getting a sense of where, what your, where your overall pipeline sits, is that you really want to then connect this to individual development. So let's take a couple of examples of how you might do that. So here I've given an example of a manager, Chris, uh, of individual giving. And as this description says, she's a good performer. She has strong commitment and aspiration. And your senior team, in discussing her, really see her as having great potential. So you might place Chris in the upper middle green box, a strong performer with high potential. And the next step is then to define what the development goal would be for her. How do we help her prepare for the future? And you might imagine goals that find ways to test or stretch her in her current role or beyond to prepare her for a future leadership position. And that's the, t that's the place you want to get push the conversation beyond simply p placing Chris in a box, is to actually talk about what does she then need and how you provide it. The second example, Max, is a manager of store operations. He's a strong performer and he's committed to the organization, but for personal reasons he can't take on a broader role right now. And so his potential is limited. limited. So you might place him in the bottom right box, recognizing that this is where he sits right now. It's important to retain him because he's such a strong performer. But it's also going to be important to periodically reassess his potential for growth because his personal situation and his ambitions might change over time. So this kind of tool um, is not something that only large national organizations with huge staff can do. In fact, while we first encountered this tool, um, when we first encountered this tool was actually in the nonprofit sector with an organization called Europe, where Gerald Sertavian is their CEO. Now, Ye Europe is a nonprofit that works with urban adults to help them reach their full potential. And when Europe was a one-site operation with just about a million in revenue, Gerald would take his team of leaders, those um, who he considered his senior team, off-site to his house every year. And they would plot every staff member on a simpler two-by-two -two version of the performance potential matrix. And they'd talk about each person and their potential and the ways that they as a team were going to commit to developing them. So you can imagine how powerful it would be for your team to have a clear understanding of who represents the future and what you collectively need to help them be ready. Now, Europe is now a $30 million organization, and they still use this tool. Um, but now they look site by site and across the organization to do so, and have gotten a little more formalized about the process. I'm going to stop in a minute to take questions, but I wanted to first share a couple of 
both benefits and watchouts to keep in mind when you introduce a tool like this. So the benefits are that it can really help to create an understanding of among your leaders about what it actually takes to be a high performer. And uh, also push the discussion that you can have together about what it's going to take to get there. So what kind of assignments or coaching or training might be needed. But there are watchouts, some of which we've mentioned already. You do need to have clear criteria for potential. And you need to have regular conversations with your employees. So you have to have a willingness to be transparent um, and have regular discussions about aspirations and commitment, understanding of ability and performance. And so that will take some internal discussion because you know, for some nonprofits, this may be a difficult or even kind of countercultural exercise, the idea of assessing folks on potential. And so you really do need to stop to ask yourself what might work in your organization. So Ben, I want to stop there um, because we've now talked about another, another step in the, the evaluation of future needs and see if other questions have come up. Yeah. There have. I, I think there, there are two questions immediately that come up. The first, you know, for organizations that, and, and I think the context is for an organization who's new to this kind of assessment, and you, you briefly touched on that as a watch out about whether it would fit with their culture, but how would you recommend introducing this if, no, if, if that hasn't been historically a, a type of behavior or action? Yeah, I mean, I think like many of the tools and tactics we share in the guide, this is best um, done as a first step with the CEO and their senior team. So um, one of the kind of first steps I'll recommend uh, at the close of this presentation is that you know everyone on this call try to do this for a couple of your own direct reports, um, just sort of testing it out. And then maybe do it as a senior team um, to see, you know, See where, one, how aligned are you on definitions of things like potential? Um, you know, what do you discover in the process? Uh, and, and essentially test it out on a small group of people before trying to cascade and use it across the organization. And just by testing it out, I think you'll start to see where the questions come up for you, what, what is important to communicate if you decide to do this more broadly. Um, you know, what kind of even simple things like is a three by three really valuable or is it just a simple two by two a good way to get the conversation going. So um, at some level what, we, what we're suggesting is you should just play with it a little bit mm -hmm. and, and then move from there. Good. One other question that, that came up was does high potential always mean a commitment to more time with an organization? So in that max example does that leave them out of leadership development, or are there other ways that you could kind of keep them in the loop, so to say? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think when you think back to the three criteria, ability, engagement, and aspiration, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination and, in the end, a judgment on those factors. So if there were someone who, um, you know, you think has a lot of, could, could take on more, um, I think it'd be that it's always valuable to have that conversation with them and understand what their um, kind of limits are. So it may be that they absolutely can take on more and new things, but they have to do less of something else, which is a way to balance that. Um, or it may be that you know, frankly, they are excited about that, but it's just not the right moment, and it may be a revisiting in the future. So. I don't think all of this is um, like everything else that has to do with human capital, mm -hmm. very much, uh, very much nuanced. Um, but it is important to sort of keep that commitment, you know, ask that question about longer term goals, um, and at the same time, let that person know that you're committed to them as well, and and and, and so it's a partnership. That's good. We had one other question that I think is really interesting for a lot of organizations, and that's, you know, if in an annual review there's a component of self-evaluation, do you have any thoughts on how to integrate this for staff to potentially consider their own potential? 
Oh, that's a great point, and one I, I should have made before. I do um, in the organizations we talk to and reference in the guide. Um, I think almost all of them have some form of self-evaluation because if you're going to sit down and talk with someone about their potential, um, you're going to want to ask them how they, you know, what how they assess themselves. Um, what I what we don't necessarily recommend is that you you know are going to pull out a grid and ask everyone to place themselves on the grid. And I mean that may you may be in a culture where that's totally fine and, and something people have fun with, but um, I think that it can be more useful to just say, you know, here's how we as an organization, well, one, here's the needs we're going to have in the future, we think, um, no guarantees. Here's, here's what, uh, so that's here's what we need. When you think about that for your role or future roles, you know, how do you, how do you assess yourself and what do you think you're going to need to grow into that? It's a great point and I think has a lot of value. Um, you, to the extent that you're sitting down and having conversations, you absolutely want to give people ownership and a chance to engage. Great. Terrific. So um, let's now talk about developing future leaders um, and actually what it takes, having identified some folks um, and what they need, what does successful development require. And so, Ben, I'm going to ask you to launch another quick poll on this. And the question here is, which of the following activities do you believe is most likely to be powerful in developing leadership skills? So formal training opportunities, mentoring from a senior leader, or on-the-job stretch opportunities? Great, and so that poll is, is underway, and people are, the responses are trickling in. So far, with about half of the votes in, it looks like about 60% are on-the-job stretch opportunities. About 40% look to be mentoring from a senior leader, and the remaining 5% is through formal training courses. Great, and, um, and I think I hinted at this a little bit earlier as well. Um, it, it, this idea that on-the-job opportunities are most important is actually borne out through the research. So what the research shows is, and this is um, from the Center for Creative Leadership um, a couple of decades ago actually started this research and has sort of consistently found results ever since, that when it comes to leadership development, so the development of leadership skills, on-the-job learning seems to drive 70% of that learning, mentoring and coaching another 20%, and formal training really only 10%. Now, these are most powerful when the three are tightly integrated, but, the, but the, I think the lesson is where many of us often go or where you'll hear organizations go when they're thinking about development is to training, offering training and workshop opportunities. While that's important, it's really only a small piece of the puzzle. And so one organization we talked to that has done a really interesting thing with this is they've started to encourage their employees at all levels to think about the power of the 70-20-10 approach um, and the, by putting it as into their development form. So what you see here is that the YMCA of the USA, um, in their own performance process, have asked people to create development plans that embed the 70-20-10 approach. So basically here, they ask employees, so there's some self-assessment, and the manager to identify the mix of stretch <coughs> opportunities coaching and formal training that they might use to develop the required skills. And so if you think back to our earlier example of Chris, the individual giving manager, you could imagine a development plan that might look something like what's shown on this slide. Um, you know, if, if the competency she needs to develop is training and communications related to funding, there may be some experience-based assignments like developing and leading presentations, doing something with the board. There may be particular people who she really needs to interact with, like a volunteer coordinator or a board chair. And then there may be some formal training or self-study that 
she does. So let me stop um, before taking kind of more general questions with a few just reminders of how one might get started in this work. The first is, as I said, Ben's going to send out a link to our leadership diagnostic survey um, that you can complete as an individual and get automated results that sort of says along these five um, areas, the five um, processes, where are we strong and where are we weak? And if you decide you actually would like your senior team, for example, to take it, we can make that available. Um, think about using that performance potential matrix to map one two of your direct reports. And then actually ask yourself, what is the mix of 70, 20, 10 assignments that might be most helpful to them in supporting their development? So and if you, if you try it out and you find it interesting, ask your, maybe your full team to do this exercise together with, it, with their own direct reports. Um, and last but certainly not least, think about setting aside some time at your next team meeting or planning or retreat to either review the diagnostics if you've done that or talking about where we started off, which is really mapping out future needs and where you think those may take you in the organization. Um, ben, let me turn it back to you now and see what general questions we may have. Great. So, so one is a question about the, the handouts. Yeah. And, and that's, is there a facilitator guide available to walk the leadership teams through the process of, of kind of how to go through each of these steps? Would that be available in the, in the, in the larger book? Yeah, so in the, in the book itself, it does walk through each of these, um, each of these items, in, 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 frankly, in much greater depth than we did today. Um, the other thing is that um, we have started to create a series of videos. That, um, the first video talks about how to assess future leadership needs. The second one um, talks about assessing performance and potential. And the third, which I think is coming out next month, um, relates to the 70-20-10. And so what I, would, what I can do is um, then maybe give you um, the links to the first two videos that have already come out. Um, so you can send that around and, and teams could watch that to help them. And each is about you know, five to seven minutes long, so they're not very long. And then the, when the third video is going to come out, it, these all are coming out in our Leaders Matter newsletter. So what I'd recommend is for ev everyone online who's interested to just subscribe to that, which you can do on our website. Um, and then you'll get the future videos as they come out. It is a great blog. I'd strongly recommend people to subscribe. A another question that, that we had is, are you seeing specific nonprofit areas that are have a, a greater need or for additional leadership, or is it generally across the board? So are there certain functions that you see common areas, or is it, is it a, more of a general? Yeah, I mean, obviously every organization is different. Some areas that have seen um, growth, I think, in particular are um, performance measurement. I think we see a lot more Organ funders and organizations wanting to think about performance measurement and what the capabilities are that are required there and, and sometimes you know really deciding that it's important to have internal staff who are not just engaged but some who are dedicated to it. So you definitely see that here. The other place is um, you know I think uh, there's a lot more partnering going on and collaborations not just across nonprofits, but between nonprofits and for-profits, or nonprofits and public sector organizations. And um, you know, in that case, you sometimes want to, um, you know, either develop or bring in some capacity to, uh, so that your own organization can understand how these other types of organizations think. That's a great way to develop some partnerships too. You know, in, in other senses. Yeah, absolutely. One question, you know, a lot of the context here has been with a nonprofit organization that has full-time staff. Um, one participant is curious if this could apply to a governing board that's drawn from membership. Um, I think to the extent that you have, um, and, I, and I've had conversations with folks about governing boards as well, um, I think to the extent that 
you are seeing the needs of that board to change, which frankly often is the case. So let's say you do a new strategy. You may have a different funding model. You may have different set of services that governing board needs to evolve. You absolutely want to keep these principles in mind, both you know, thinking about some of the key leaders you have and, and how they may be transitioning out over time, but also what are the needs, the new needs. What I don't know, um, you know, I think this is where actually having a good conversation with whoever's the lead of that board can be useful because you'd want to work together to think about next steps. Mm. One, one, one participant also had a question about coaching and how, you know, both internal and external coaching, how they fit in leadership development strategies in the nonprofit sector. How you see that? Yeah, you know, I think that um, particularly when um, when you're uh, when you get to that point where, and we talk about this in the guide, where you're trying to build. Um, well, let's just step back a second. For any of this to work well, if you think about that 70-20-10 concept and developing leaders, you actually have to have managers including your senior team, who are effective in developing other people, because they're the ones who are going to give the assignments, have the conversations about potential, um, provide the, a lot of the coaching and mentoring. And not all of us are, are great at that, right? We may not have been managed particularly well ourselves. Um, we may not have had many good role models. And so I think um, you know what I've seen can be quite powerful is either to bring in someone uh, let's say, for example, you're going to be having feedback conversations and conversations about potential for the first time, and you think that could be tricky. You know, actually bringing in a coach, even for a working one working session with your senior team, to talk about how to set that up and navigate it well can be good. The other thing is, you may find, and we talk in the guide in more depth about the fact that. Um, when you look at across managers, there are those people who we call talent champions. These are the people who are really committed to developing other people and are really good at it, right? And um, in the, the for-profit sector, the estimate is about 20% of, of managers fall into that. Um, another 40% are actually like, engaged and committed, but just don't feel like they know what to do or how to do it. And then, of mm. course, there are some who, who just aren't convinced that it's important. For those people who, um, you know, I would say if you can move that 40% that committed but just not effective into the committed and effective right there, like triple the number of effective developers you have. And <laughs> my, my sense would be if you can bring in, you know, a coach or even just highlight, you know, um, what those people who are already good at it are doing, that could be quite powerful. And it can be done in a targeted way, so it doesn't have to sort of break the bank to, to have that support. I think that's great advice as well, just from, from our experience. You know, the mission comes first, and if people are dedicated to it, they'll find ways and be open to finding ways to, to solve it. Absolutely. If there are any other questions, please feel free to, to post them in, and, and, and we're happy to ask. We have about five minutes remaining. Preeta, are there other trends that you see as, as being important, you know, in, in terms of keeping the conversation going after the first assessment or, or, or and after reviewing it? That can be helpful just to keep things moving? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that we um, suggest, and there are some different examples of this in the guide, is to the extent, so bottom line is, um, this doesn't work if it's considered sort of a separate initiative. You know, this is the year of focusing on leaders or whatever it is. Um, the only way it works is if you build in um, the practices as part of your ongoing kind of business rhythm. So, for example, if you want to start using the performance potential matrix or some tool to, you know, have the potential conversation. You want to do that at a natural time. It might be when you're doing your performance reviews. Anyway, you set aside an additional you know, time as a team, uh, maybe in you know, a couple of the senior meetings you're going to have anyway, 
to have a conversation about potential. And you don't just have it once, because the first time you do it, it'll, you know, you'll be sort of working out kinks. But you do it mm -hmm. the following year and the year after that, and it becomes a regular part of how you do business. Similarly, if you're thinking, oh, yeah, we should take more of this 70-20-10 in mind, um, you know, think about how you build that into the forms that people are already completing or the conversations they're already having. Um, and last but not least, I think I mentioned that there's, you know, anytime you're doing strategy or annual planning, this is another way to insert an important question into those things you're already doing periodically. That's absolutely the best way to start it. Great. One more question that, that came up was what you see going on in the trends for using 360 reviews in the nonprofit sector that's somewhat popular in, in, in for-profit organizations, but bring that over. Is, is that a, an ongoing trend you see? So I don't know what it looks like from a trend perspective. So I don't know how it has changed over time. Um, I do think that many organizations are using it and finding it very helpful. And I, I guess the one thing I would say is um, it doesn't have to be that complex to do it. Um, I think the trick is sort of thinking through how you, um, how you deliver 360 feedback in a situation where, you know, there's only one or two people who are kind of commenting on someone's performance. The way I've seen it done is to actually bring in either to select someone who's sort of a third party in the organization or to bring in someone um, who will just interview folks to understand themes um, and look not just at your direct reports, but talk to your bosses, talk to your clients, you know, really try to get a rich set of information. Um, the, I think the one thing I have noticed is it, too often it, it happens only when there's like a big problem and then then it feels like, oh, this is, this is something we're doing because we have an issue or a crisis. When the truth is, I think most of us, um, however good or we are or not, um, would love to get more often get honest feedback on, on how we're doing and what we can do better. So if it's something that can become a little bit more regular as opposed to a crisis response, that would be great. That changes the context of it too, you know, where it becomes much more of a, a positive and constructive moment. I think I think that's great advice. Absolutely. Well, well, please join me in thanking both Preta for today's content. This was this was wonderful, and, and this is an excellent kickoff to to our virtual leadership series, and also BMO Harris for their support. The information that was shared again, as well as the webinar recording will be um, emailed out to all the participants and also the, the webinar recording will be posted on our website. In specific, uh, we will be emailing out a copy of the presentation, a link to the full guide of nonprofit leadership development, what's your plan A for developing future leaders, the videos that were mentioned earlier, and a link to the self-assessment that you can take so you can actually put this into practice for yourself. One last final note, just before we, we end, um, you'll be directed to a very concise questionnaire of about four questions on today's webinar. Please take a, mo a moment or two to complete it. It really helps us continue and understand the effectiveness of our offering. And thank you again very much, and, and enjoy your day. Thank you.